Welcome back. You're listening to Get Real with Bob and Stacy. Real people, real issues, and real estate here on the Money Matters Radio Network. Joining us by phone today, very special guest for our Leaders and Legends segment, Lawrence Houghton. Houghton. Uh, Lawrence is the head of research and development for best-selling author and business thought leader Jason Jennings, and together they've written uh, six best-selling books. The newest book, The High Speed Company, is a how-to guide to for creating urgency and growth in our nanosecond culture. Welcome to the show, Lawrence. Thank you very much. So we are a big fan of your book, um, The High Speed Company, and what's awesome about it is you dispel a lot of myths that um, are predominant in building a business. For example, um, this is one that I've always believed in, that you have to go big when you're building a business, and you say that is myth number one. Why is going big as a business a myth? Well, going big is a myth because what people do is that they then sit on their hands until they come up with something big. Mm. And certainly, high-speed companies, they go big, but they go big after they've done something else. What they do is they remember, as you probably can remember from uh, childhood, that there was a special lesson, and it was called the law of the fairy tale ending. If you want to find a prince, you got to kiss a lot of frogs. Mm-hmm. Mm. And what high-speed companies do is that they will go big, but only after they have experimented, as they have prototyped, and they are constantly in motion trying out ideas, testing p- various theories, testing various products, and seeing which, one of, which ones of them are going to pay off. As a matter of fact, that was a big way that Starbucks reinvented themselves and reignited their success after they had their downturn in the uh, 2000s, uh, shortly after Howard Schultz left the first time. Right. By the way, could you explain to our listeners how you went about researching? Because one of the best things about your book is that this is highly researched. Like you've been out interviewing thousands of people and studying companies. What is the process that you use to do that? And who have you talked to? The, we are data-driven in, um, in the work that we do, and we have, over the course of the last dozen years, interviewed about 11,000 business leaders, hmm. that's executives, CEOs, and entrepreneurs across the country and in various locales around the world. And when we do our kind of interviews, it's not the sort of thing that you would find when a survey company calls you, because like yourselves, We're in business, and we therefore understand business. And so when we talk to business people, they recognize that very quickly, and they're very fast to begin to reveal what's really going on, the Hmm. kinds of things that you're not going to get in press releases, nor are you going to get them in the popular media, but the kinds of things that business people talk about when they're together uh, after a conference or later on in the evening, Uh, when they're really revealing what it is that they're concerned with and what it is that they've done, what's worked and what hasn't worked. So we've been very lucky because most business people are extremely candid, very honest, because they're in real search for better answers uh, so that they can bring them to the marketplace and and, and do well. Hmm. So the first thing that we do as as a part of our research is we rely on the interviews that we do, but we don't stop there. Mm-hmm. We obviously have tracked more than 220,000 companies. We've analyzed the financials of about 55,000 businesses over the course of the last decade. Uh, and we are big readers of, of the kind of technical white papers and academic journals and other types of uh, research that most people wait to just catch a little bit of the digest. That's what our job is is to pull that together and to digest it. So all of those things come together in our research. And then we go one step further, which is we look for the kinds of stories that make it easy for everyone to get the point. Hmm. Wow, that's interesting. Um, Do you find at the start of the book, you talk about what a high speed company is. You say basically businesses need to change fast enough on the inside to keep up with the change on the outside. In this day and age with technology, and it seems like the world just moves so fast, 
do you find that you have to be a high speed company to just survive? Yes, you have to keep growing. Mm -hmm. You have to keep moving forward just to survive. But don't ever get confused about the concept of a high speed company because from our first book, which was It's Not the Big That Eat the Small, It's the Fast That Eat the Slow, mm -hmm. that was our first book, our first look into making speed and, uh, and quickness and, and adaptability the competitive advantages in business. Mm -hmm. And from the time that we looked at that, we noticed something that most people overlook, and that is that speed is really the natural condition. Mm -hmm. In other words, who wants to wait forever for anything? Right. Long lines are frustrating. When somebody uh, in a store and you're trying to explain something to them, when they don't get it and you have to explain again and again and again, our, our frustration level goes up. When we put out a new idea in a business and the bureaucracy slows down our ability to implement it, that's annoying. And so really, as people, um, we love the thrill, the elation of speed, and we're naturally quick. Uh, to move, but what happens in business is we get told uh, you have to worry about every possible risk and try and expose everything that might possibly happen before you make a move because if you, well, to use what my mother used to say to me, if you um, run that fast, you'll break your neck. Mm -hmm. And the fact is business people are quick and they are adaptable, but as they grow, particularly this was the uh, concept in the first book, big companies get just unbelievably bogged down and slow and hesitant and cautious. Uh, some businesses, as they get old, they do that. Other businesses have been around 100 years, and they're still quick, just like they were when they were started. So we look for those things that, are, that, that will make a business quick. We look for the business, things that will make a business able to adapt, uh, able to see the signals of what's going on in the marketplace and then respond to it and uh, rather, than, um, rather than sit in the status quo and suffer the stalls that can actually become the death of a business. A business stalls, 93% uh, of companies that get stuck in a stall uh, will be, it, it, it's fatal. Hmm. Really? Can you give us an example of a big company that still acts quickly? Well, again, I, I sure can. And uh, they do that by fighting all of the impulses of a big company. And one of the biggest that still acts quickly is Procter & Gamble. Procter hmm. & Gamble is a, is a gigantic company. Right now, they're, they're attempting... Uh, to find 600 million new customers worldwide in, you know, in, in every market that they, they, uh, they operate in. And in order to be able to do that, they know that they've got to really understand the customer. So as an example, in a huge company, they spend millions and millions of dollars and, and employ a group of 7,000 researchers just to help them figure out what it is that's going on uh, with their customers, with the people who are likely to buy the fabric care, uh, the personal care products, and the other things that are part of the Procter & Gamble uh, stable. But they also do something that's very interesting and almost harkens back to the way that business used to be uh, in, the last, in the early part of the last century. Procter & Gamble insists that when they go and they take these leadership trips, like every big business does, they might go to uh, uh, Geneva or they would go to uh, uh, Istanbul, Turkey or something like that and get a lot of the leaders from around the world together to have a conference. They have to spend an equal amount of time as they spend in the conference in that hotel room. They have to spend an equal amount of time out with the customers. Wow. And so you've got the head of marketing for the world of Procter & Gamble actually in the home. We, have, we watch this happen. Uh, mm -hmm. actually in the home listening to a young woman and a young man with young children talking about all of their, uh, their needs and their issues and the way that they take care of their family and how fabric care falls into that. They're not trying to sell them uh, Procter & Gamble products. They're trying to find out what's 
sensible for what's coming up next. And what that allows them to do is it allows them to take the research from all their PhDs and all their research studies and add what they call the emotional human element to it, or in other words, to, to understand it from, from the perspective of people like us who are thinking day in and day out, how do we go through life and, and go through life happily, making our families happy? And they stay connected to that as a big company. So that's, that's a way a very, very big company stays very, very nimble, and that's by forcing themselves uh, to get out of the conference room and into the homes of customers, into the shops of their retailers, into the distribution centers, and see what's really going on. Hmm. That's amazing. One of the other I, myths... I think it is. One of the other myths that you talk about is the myth that every minute of planning saves 10. You say it's not true. Can you explain that? The North American president of IKEA said to me in an interview, in one of these revealing conversations that we talk mm -hmm. about, having 11,000 of them over the last dozen years, she said, planning is good, exaggerated planning is death. Mm. And so I said, wait a second, you have to explain that to me, because IKEA is a very big company with a lot of moving parts, and I know from what I have learned from business people about retail, that it's a business built around setting plans, uh, creating uh, uh, open to buy and um, all of the financial elements, making sure that you're assorted, making sure that your products are moving through and they're moving through with velocity. And she explained to me in that how um, effective planning is a uh, obvious sensible item, but because people have developed this sort of risk-adverse Slow as molasses, bureaucracy mindset, all of a sudden meetings have grown and grown and grown, and the requ requirement for, uh, for budget forecasting and chewing over every number and looking at it from all of these different directions has gone to the point where it takes hordes of people a lot of time. As a matter of fact, the organizations, these are the billion dollar organizations. They invest 200,000 man hours per billion dollars in revenue in doing nothing but planning. That's and staggering. I think all of us mm. have seen that. Hmm? Right. That's mind boggling they could spend that much time planning. Well, and combine that with now, let's take a look at the success record of all of that because the whole idea is hey, if we do this kind of planning, we're going to have a lot less flops, right? We're going to have a lot less right. uh, bonehead moves. We're going to have a lot less mistakes. Well, um, General Motors was one of those companies. How'd that work out? Mm, I mean, if we just start going through the list, the list of people who are who have devoted this, and look at some of the actions that have come out of it, you say, exaggerated planning is really um, just as this woman uh, told us, the president of IKEA North America, um, it really is that. First of all, it wastes the most precious resource, which is our time. And uh, as I uh, mentioned uh, in the book, um, research shows that, and, and your own experience confirms it, 80% uh, of the hours in meetings are, are addressing things that aren't important. Only 20% of what, what's important ever gets addressed in a meeting. So in other words, we've got all kinds of time being used on things that you just assume you're sitting there just twiddling your thumbs. The other thing is you get really rigid when you have exaggerated planning. And I think you've seen this or heard about this from uh, maybe relatives who are in companies where they have strategy plans that, uh, that are um, the size of, uh, uh, of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they sit there, and they, they, have to, they have to refer to it every time they do anything, and they become rigid because all they want to do is whatever is already in the book. And, of course, there's always the old thing that we talk about called paralysis by analysis. Mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. that's where we're so worried about being wrong that we never do anything. Hmm. And that's the wrongest thing of them all. Hmm. That's interesting because it seems like that's just like a company culture that's built because I do feel that um, planning can sometimes be the enemy of execution, of actually doing something. And as a company, if you're always planning, probably your salespeople are always planning and really nothing ever gets done quickly. Um, 
Do you? No, that's true, and you can use it as an excuse to never get out there. And, Absolutely. You know, strategy, really good strategy. If you study strategy and you look for it, you can say one thing about it. A whole lot of the best strategy is made by doing. Mm-hmm. And so you watch as people are doing and, 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 and acting. Um, I watched as they developed the Shake Shack uh, uh, idea uh, from a one store to where they are today uh, at, at the Union Square Hospitality Group. But I can tell you that was, that, was, that was just from doing something that they were interested in. And all of a sudden, it began to take hold and business, their business acumen got in there and said, wait a second, this could get bigger and bigger. And away they went. And that's where Shake Shack really came from. Wow. And it seems like, I know we only have about 30 seconds left, but it seems like you have to instill growth as part of your company culture so that your employees, your customers, people embrace it so that they feel like your continued growth is an asset to them as well. Correct? Well, and, and, people, and people love to be around things that are growing. You're exactly right. And there's always that question that people ask. Again, we've done, you know, thousands of pages of writing and everybody always says okay get it down to one thing for me can you get mm. it down to just one word can you make a tweet size uh recommendation to us and it's very frustrating mm-hmm. I have to say, <laughs> a writer you know you you say oh my god do you realize i've already done that with five hundred thousand pages of research right but it's a good question and you know what the answer is to the one thing you can get down to if you focus on growth Almost every other thing that you need to pay attention to will come to you because to grow, you have to adapt. You have to uh, be close to the customer. You have to do all these good things. And that was a lesson taught to us uh, by the uh, CEO of Aero Electronics, which Mm. has grown quite substantially over the last decade, and they've been around about 100 years. Awesome. I think that is all the time we have for today. And again, this book uh, by Lawrence Houghton and Jason Jennings, The High Speed Company, Creating Urgency and Growth in a Nanosecond Culture. Thank you for joining us today, Lawrence. Thanks, Lawrence. Thank you very much for your interest. You're welcome. That's it for this edition of Get Real with Bob and Stacy. Make sure you tune in again next weekend.